Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. So let's talk about all the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in The Boys, Episode 6. And boy, what an episode. Let me know what you think was the most messed up moment down in the comments. I'm going to go with this one. Tell Butcher about a thick penis around your neck. Now this episode is all about characters confronting their guilt over past murders and wondering how many moral lines they're willing to cross. On one end of the spectrum, you have Homelander and Stormfront, who are only loyal to themselves or people who are like themselves. Homelander's embrace of Nazism at the end of the episode doesn't feel like a reach. He's expressed casual racism in the past. So what, they're all starving, but one of them's got a f***ing cell phone? <laughs> and also believes in the genetic superiority of the Superman. We're a different f***ing breed. You've been helping these f***ing mud people. Also, the name Homelander does call to mind the German word Vaterland, or fatherland. The idea being that he exists for the glory of the nationalist state and not for the benefit of the whole human race. It's Americans that are going to keep us in the army, not the World. But Butcher's own beliefs aren't that far from Homelander and Stormfronts. Never go into shark and face the waters without chum. He rejected Becca's soup son simply for the way he was born. And in this episode, Annie points out that he has a quasi-racist bias. What you can't stand is in my blood. I'm subhuman to you. But there are other moral lines being drawn in this episode. Lamplighter has basically resigned himself to killing innocents after accidentally murdering Mallory's grandkids. Maeve tries to defend her actions to Elena, and Frenchie is racked with guilt over allowing Mallory's grandkids to die. What makes you think I want to be let off the hobo? Annie, in particular, has fallen into a moral gray area. When the show began, she genuinely wanted to do good. I mean, why would you get into this business if not to save the world? But now, when she accidentally kills a man on the road, she blames him. You know what I was thinking when I was looking at him? Why'd you pull the gun, you stupid fuck? On the other hand, Lamplighter is constantly consumed with guilt. You'd be doing me a favor. Do it. This episode also has a few symmetrical storylines, like hospitals. Butcher and Annie are trying to get into one, while everyone else is trying to break out of one. Similarly, A-Train and the Deep are using the church to cover up their secrets. For a man in seven-figure debt, a heart condition, and in heavy withdrawal, do you really think you have the luxury to get up and leave? While Maeve is conspiring to reveal her secrets. And also, there's the symmetry of hitchhiking. The good guys can't get a ride without killing, but Cindy gets a ride non-violently. So, let's break this episode down. The title is The Bloody Doors Off, named after the final arc from the comics. In this case, it's referring to the literal doors exploding at Sage Grove and everyone revealing their secrets. Like, as I guessed, Stormfront is a Nazi. The opening track and music video is a song called Cap Upside Down by the French group Session Assault. This was written in response to a French politician who claimed that young men were not properly assimilating into French society because they wore their caps backwards. In other words, they were rejecting white French society and embracing hip-hop culture. And there's lots of parallels to this in this episode. The boys, and now Annie, refuse to assimilate into the soup hero culture that dominates the world. Vought is also trying to incorporate the prisoners at Sage Grove into their plans for society. And it also turns out that Stormfront is the head of Vought, and she's using the entire company to assimilate the world into a culture of a master race. We are in a war for the culture. In Frenchie's apartment, he has a poster for a soup called Cold Snap. Now in the comics, he was an Iceman-like character who was a member of G-Force. That's the book's answer to X-Force. Later in the episode, Mallory reveals that Frenchie killed Cold Snap, so this poster could be research or a kind of trophy. Also, Sean Ashmore, who plays Lamplighter, also played Iceman in the X-Men movies. And he's really good in this too. I didn't know. I didn't know that you were gonna be in that bed. Jordana LaHoy returns as Sherry, and Frenchie calls her and his other friend his Golden Girls. This was an 80s sitcom about four retired women living together, and it's awesome. Still holds up. Watch it on Hulu. Not getting paid to say that. Genuinely recommending the Golden Girls to you. Dorothy, you told me exactly what you wanted me to do a dozen times. Any idiot could have done it. I know, honey, but you were the only one going down. <laughs> and of course, the theme song closes out this episode. Thank you for being so, this shows that Frenchie is always looking for a surrogate family, be it this group or the boys. Back in present day, he calls Huey Stan his nickname for him in the comics. In this opening scene, Frenchie is wearing goggles, a nod to his look in the comics. Now, Huey is wearing a t-shirt of Billy Joel's album, The Stranger. The lyrics of its title track seem especially relevant to superheroes, masks, and deception. 
Well, we all have a face that we hide away forever and we take them out and show ourselves when everyone has gone. Then there's this incredibly messed up scene of Stormfront and Homelander stopping this guy in the alley. And notice the Saving America propaganda posters lining the walls. There's always been an undercurrent of sexuality in superhero comics. Uh, well, maybe not an undercurrent. It's, I guess it's pretty on the surface. Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons, The Watchman, addressed this delicately when a retired hero was sexually impotent until he put on his costume. The Boys does not address anything delicately. In fact, this is the single image that I would say best defines the show. The whole essence of The Boys in one perfect shot. Now this scene where they take the law into their own hands foreshadows the last scene where they declare themselves the master race. And then they smash set to the turtles happy together. <laughs> when Annie meets Butcher, she says, Yeah, no thanks to the 50 caliber round that she pumped into my chest. A reference to episode seven last season. And the reason Kumiko hugs her is because she saved her life in that same episode. The Brave Maeve ad campaign is in full swing and she has her very own protein bar. And A-Train is forced to hear the humiliation of his anthem sung by an overweight white man who can't possibly understand A-Train's life struggles. But I'm the best to ever do it, y'all crazy. Make way or you're pushing up daisy. But Ashley says that Lil Nas X is going to do the final recording, so that'll be much better. By the way, this guy is Chris Leonard, the actual music composer on the show. They also reference Prince's guitar from Purple Rain, which we saw a couple episodes ago. In a flashback, Frenchie meets Mallory and she mentions that he killed Mal Chemical. That's a soup from the comics. She name drops the real life terrorists, the Unabomber and the Aryan Brotherhood, another foreshadow of the episode's final scene where Homelander converts to Nazism. And it turns out that Sage Grove is a kind of concentration camp filled with human experiments, like those conducted by Joseph Mengele in Nazi Germany. A couple of these soups are based on characters from the comics. Like Love Sausage, the enormous Russian man who's put a new spin on the one-eyed monster at the door trope. And this is Discharge, a member of G-Wiz from the comics. And by the way, Cindy sure does seem like she's inspired by Eleven from Stranger Things, right? And of course, you gotta recognize this hero. This is your mom. But for real, this could be the tiny hero that we saw in the sex club back at episode one. And like I said before, Lamplighter is played by Iceman, but his powers work much more like Pyro, Iceman's rival from the X-Men films. Note that he can't create flame, only manipulate it. I thought Homelander's temper tantrum about Stormfront and the Roses was very in character. He's thin-skinned and reacts violently to embarrassment. But more importantly, he's afraid Stormfront will become another Madeline Stillwell. Madeline controlled Homelander by lying to him and he senses that Stormfront is manipulating him in the same way. Give me the truth, or I walk out right now. After all, he's been manipulated by people since he was a baby, and he's sick of it. Then we have the Deep and A-Train eating with Alistair Adana, head of the Church of the Collective. Now, the music here is Sail Away by Enya. Oh, hell no. And notice it's diegetic, meaning that Alistair chose this music. This says a lot about him, but also about the church and how they try to comfort people who are in distress. You've been kicked out of the seven? Doesn't matter, just. He name drops. Did you catch Malala Yousafzai's tweet? Called you a sweetheart. <laughs> now this is a Pakistani human rights activist and Nobel Peace Prize winner. It's weird that the show implied that her social media was for sale because she's a universally respected person in real life. But in this universe, maybe she's a member of the church? A-Train mentions. I've seen that documentary about you guys. Now this could be a reference to the numerous Scientology documentaries like Going Clear. Speaking of Scientology, notice there are two paintings on the wall. One is of Alistair, and the other one is an older man. This is probably the founder of the Church of the Collective, a parallel to L. Ron Hubbard. That would make Alistair David Miskevich, the current head of Scientology. Then he drops this bomb. They're gonna give Shockwave your uniform, you know that? Now, this is a real knife twist, because it means that the shitty song Ashley played for him earlier is not even going to be his song. It's being written for Shockwave. And of course, this happens in the comics all the time, with different characters taking on the mantle of the Flash or other heroes. And then we go from the church juicing people with Fresca to Vought juicing people with Compound V. In the comics, Compound V is also unstable. It's very difficult and expensive to create a soup as powerful as Homelander, while most heroes end up with kind of low-grade powers. Now, I'm wondering if this season will end with the 
voice taking a stabilized compound V and getting powers of their own. In the comics, this is how they're able to kill so many soups. They also have superpowers. Then again, the reason this show works is because they're the underdogs, constantly having to outsmart Vought instead of fighting them face to face. Would you like to see Butcher and the rest get powers? Let me know down in the comments. Now notice Lamplighter's torch is different from the comics. It's more in the shape of Green Lantern's power battery, since he was the inspiration for the character in the books. Frenchie follows him to a movie premiere called Light and Shadow, Journey into Night. Now Light and Shadow aren't characters from the comics, but this seems like a spin on the Marvel heroes Cloak and Dagger, who also have their own TV show on Freeform. Now this whole exchange is pretty much what happens in the comics, where the boys attempt to blackmail Homelander, but then Lamplighter goes off and intentionally murders two children in a bathtub. I like the change they've made for the show. Maybe you like watching people burn too. By the end of the episode, I'm actually feeling sorry for Lamplighter. Not just because it makes Lamplighter more relatable, but it also reveals how flexible everyone's morality is. Maybe once I would have cried over him, but now he was just another person in our way. The episode ends with them offering him to Mallory for revenge. It's exactly what happens in the comic. Except here, I think they're going to start using Lamplighter as a spy as they originally intended. While Andy and Butcher are trying to save Huey, he dusts off his fake FBI story from episode one. FBI, need to commandeer your vehicle a bit of an emergency. Name's Butcher, Billy Butcher. After Annie accidentally murders this guy, she discovers that he had a kid, which Honest Trailers pointed out is how this show always elicits sympathy. Or how the sexual deviant has a kid. He spends most of his free time with his son. Annie is quick to point out that she has not crossed the same moral lines as Butcher. We're nothing alike, nothing. And I like that in this episode, they both realize that what brings them together isn't a hatred of Vought, it's a love of Huey. He's too good for either of us. And here is a poster of Maeve encouraging people to donate blood. It's appropriate since Huey just spilled his blood trying to get rid of soups. Now the boys' storylines about guilt and blackmail intersect with Maeve, who's going to use her feelings of guilt to blackmail Homelander. And by the way, this GoPro footage was foreshadowed here. Everyone always recording on their phone all the time. Mm -hmm. But they actually created this footage with the dailies that they shot on the actual shooting day. I'm also wondering why A-Train hasn't threatened to blackmail Homelander or why Homelander hasn't killed A-Train to prevent him from talking. It was really hard for me, okay? It's nothing personal. Uh, we'll always be friends and uh, et cetera. It's like they're not even addressing that A-Train helped create the super terrorists. But the biggest holy shit moment of the episode was the revelation that Stormfront wasn't just a Nazi, she was one of THE Nazis. Notice that in her trunk, she has her original Liberty costume. And this is a great performance moment from Aya Cash. Notice how she lets an accent slip through on the word Berlin. I was born in 1919 in Berlin. If Homelander has always been a casual racist, one people, then Stormfront is doing what the racists call saying the quiet part out loud. Fucking you bastard. It makes total sense that she would fall for Homelander. After all, he is the Aryan ideal, blonde hair, blue eyes. And like all members of the Aryan Brotherhood, he's also stupid and easy to manipulate. And she reveals that she's Frederick Vought's wife, making her the secret owner of the company. And her actual goal is the other races are grinding us down and taking what is rightfully ours, but we can fight back with an army of supermen millions strong. Superheroes have always had an uncomfortable association with the idea of the Aryan Superman. After all, superheroes became popular just as this idea was spreading throughout Europe. But the boys brilliantly forwards the idea that once you give an individual or group too much power, like soups, they immediately begin to assume that others are inferior. One people. Then they use their superiority for creating justifications for acting above the law. But. He'll probably just be released tomorrow. But this train of thought's logical destination is domination of the weak over the strong. Because that is Vought's true destiny. You are everything that we dreamed of. In countries overcome by fascism, the masses cheer for the pageantry, the flags, the armies. They cheer for the strong man. I'll myself. In the world of the boys, they cheer for the superheroes. You well, that's all the Easter eggs that I found, but if you found any more, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.